happiness. All right, so guys, today we are joined by Daniel Sierra. And uh, for those who missed the first trial run of the trial run, I'm gonna go to walk you through a little bit of what he has done before this day, so everybody can know who we're talking with. Daniel is a Bachelor of Law in the Universidad Central de Venezuela, and he's also, uh, he made a specialization in the in mining and oil law in the University Externado in Colombia, and also studied in the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana uh, with a specialization in integration to the international system. And he made a specialization in leading nonviolent uh, movements in Harvard University. He is also uh, a junior attorney of Baker and McKenzie. He worked in as a junior attorney in Baker and McKenzie. Uh, he was also chief of government program in the Alcaldía de Latillo in Venezuela. He is also the, the he was the director of the formation program of Visión Democrática. Uh, also director of Vendetta organization, uh, think tank director of the Fundación La Mejor Venezuela, the best, the better Venezuela, and also counselor to the executive director of Venezuela and Panama for the Inter-American Development Bank. And he's a public policy advisor nowadays to the Venezuelan embassy to the US. So now without further ado, we bring Daniel. Very happy to have you here, bro. So. Hello. Uh Pleasure to be here. Everybody can hear you now, and we're very happy to continue this trial run to the first episode of the Leo Perez show. Uh, as I said uh, on the offline uh, time, uh, well, it's a very wonderful and meaningful thing to do this together because I remember being, what, 17, 16 years old, we're friends for almost 20 years, and being on the phone uh, together at 3 a.m. in the morning or something uh, when there was some revolution in Venezuela and I remember this never-ending iteration of like yeah then we're really gonna get out of this and yeah the things are gonna improve and then things are gonna be better however you know for us everything is very clear because we lived it and we were there uh, from day one but I have met so much people in bars and in random places who just tell me que viva el comandante and have no idea what's going on and maybe they let's let's think the best of them really we don't have to think the worst of them they they have like some sort of compassionate imagination of of how things are and they dream that this is a uh, uh, you know like a peaceful truly grassroots revolution and and I think that you know the internet needed this kind of long format open conversation about Venezuela so all the people who are trying to disarm this image that what happened in Venezuela was some sort of really grassroots beautiful uh, uh, socialist revolution uh, I mean I think it's important that people have an idea of what's going on and that's why I brought you here because you really know what's going on and you are involved in this for decades and so yeah I'm very happy that you're here. So imagine that you're in a bar and somebody's asking you, like, tells you this. It really happened to me so many times. I don't know how many times it happened to you. Has it happened to you? Yes, of course. Like, like I mean, I, I, the last time my wife had to kind of like take me out of the bar or something because I mean the thing really did not end that well because because I mean some people really want to push this uh, point through so imagine that you're in a bar and somebody tells you man like like uh, viva Chavez uh, viva la revolucion uh, and then you tell him something and then his answer is like well it's just like you're a rich boy and that's why you left your country mm -hmm. you know uh, and you don't understand and it's like ah yeah I don't understand so so what would you tell to this person if you have all its undivided attention and you can just Extend no, yourself. but I wouldn't. I wouldn't engage with that person because why would you? Uh, there, there is really no point in a in a situation in which you are in a bar and 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 there is this kind of hostility. What's the point of of, of engaging? I would, of course, have a long conversation with someone that is interested in in you know uh, opening. Uh, Uh, you know, as, asking a Venezuelan about uh, his or her experience and, and try to learn from not the, the media that he or she consumes, but, but what the person actually experienced. And so wh what did you experience? What did you experience? <clears throat> well, um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to what to tell you about that because it's it's been it's been so much. But the, the summary is the the dissolution of a republic being hijacked by a criminal group. That that would be the the. 
And how did it all this start? I mean, because because uh, this is kind of like a kind of hijack that was uh, consensual initially. It's like, hey, can you come to my house? It's kind of like you invite somebody to your house to have dinner, and then it's like, well, okay, like thank you for having dinner. Now we would like to carry on, and the person just starts trafficking drugs inside your house, and, and then you're like, dude, come on, like. So how 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 did it all start? Like, what was happening before in Venezuela? Like how how did we end up here? Yeah, um, so um, I do think that one of the advantages uh, of your of your of your Russian friends and and Russians in general to understand Venezuela is that we both share uh, one very important thing in common, which is our main source of exports, uh, which has been oil for 100 years. And it's difficult for, for our people of other countries to understand the mindset of an of a petro state, of a yeah. of a state that depends overwhelmingly for its revenue on oil. And I do think that uh, Russians have uh, uh, an advantage in thinking about this and they're going to understand a lot of what I'm going to say. The process of how uh, Venezuela was dissolved starts similar to when the Soviet Union was dissolved. Uh, of course, with different, completely different political um, uh, starting points. However, it basically it started by making a lot of commitments from the state in the 70s, and then the oil uh, market collapsing in the 80s, the oil price, and the state not being able to fulfill its commitments. This led in the Soviet Union to the... Uh -huh. yeah, mm -hmm. No, no, I get you, I get you, I get you. So, so, I mean, from the perspective of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union made a lot of commitments and then it couldn't sort them out. Like, it's like, oh, sorry, I don't have money to pay them. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was the Afghanistan war, it was the arms race, it was, you know, a, a, a lot of commitments that eventually, uh, in the 80s with the oil price collapse, they couldn't keep up with it and they had to go to reform and uh, it didn't go well <laughs> and and the soviet union dissolved or or i mean it didn't go well for what the communist party was uh, aspiring to yeah right. yeah in with venezuela there is a similar story in the 70s uh, we we acquired this unimaginable wealth uh Unimaginable. Could you put it in perspective in modern dollars or something like that? Do you have any idea? Like it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, uh, I, I I would have to to. That's fine. You know, to Just carry on. Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, unimaginable. Well, it, it really. I mean, uh, in the seventies, we were the number two exporter of oil in the world. Maybe maybe two or three. For for the audience who who has never heard what I'm about to say, there was a saying which was the La Venezuela Saudita, which means like the Saud yeah. Saudi Venezuela. I don't know, like yeah, 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 yeah. And and one important thing is that for the past 50 years before the 60s, Venezuela was the number one exporter of oil in the world. So so this mentality of oil dependent. Um, uh, state revenues has been for us since since more than a hundred years a little bit more than than a hundred years uh, actually uh, we I, I also want to to congratulate the Russian people for the the anniversary of the defeat of, of, of Nazism and fascism Venezuela played an important role in Second World War a very very important role actually Nazis uh, Nazi submarines, sank more than 10 oil tankers in Venezuela. I didn't Guatemala. know that. They're still there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there were plants. Uh, of so there was something like the, the Nazi pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Nazi submarines of the Caribbean. Oh, that sounds really nasty, man. I don't want yeah. to meet those nas those submarines, man. <laughs> <laughs> me neither, me neither. You know, I, I, make a, I make a little pause here. There was a, there was a famous uh, urban legend that uh, the president back then uh, was... Uh, si 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 who was the president back then? Uh, uh, we had Isaias Medina. Isaias Medina. Yes. Yeah. There, there was this famous thing that they disguised some... Uh, coconut trees have you heard this story or this is bullshit have you heard this know. story I, I mean there's a story that they painted some coconut trees in black uh, to kind of uh, generate the impression it sounds very Venezuelan thing to me I mean that's a, and that's the thing that okay. makes 
<laughs> so the... No, that's that, that. I've heard that story. I've heard the story, but not. It's not Medina Garita. Mm. Is Cipriano Castro, <laughs> ah, 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 which was, was before, which was in the year 1902, uh -huh. where the British and German fleets. Uh, went to <laughs> Venezuela to collect debts by force. That's the thing, you know, making continuing in this uh, kind of erratic erratic path towards where we're going, which is gonna all make sense. You know, that's one of the problems when people think about Venezuela is that they have no idea how irresponsible and crazy that place is. That something like what I just said is absolutely <laughs> totally possible. I mean, that somebody paints. So, no, it's not that somebody paints the, the freaking coconuts in black. It's just like they do it. I mean, it's like, ah, well, that sounds like a great idea. So. So we're back. We're back to the to the oil commitments, the 70s, uh, gathering a yeah. lot of resources. And, and you know, I want you to hold there, uh, to hold there, and um, hold that idea there because I want to make a little inter interruption here. Um, mm -hmm. I want to make a very brief, super fast history of Venezuela, and I, and I want to start with something. People think there's a question of what's the origin of the name Venezuela. And uh, in, according to the understanding that I have, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the name Venezuela is connected with the word Mujerzuela, which is like a shitty Venice. This was something told to me by historian uh, Elias Pino y Turrieta, um, yeah. which makes more sense that the little Venice theory, which is what we were told in Venecita. school. Venezita, yeah. And I remember being in a barbecue with some friends in the house of Elias Pino y Turrieta, and we were talking, and he laughed at us like about how freaking naive we were. And I'm saying that because the the story of Venezuela, regardless if this story that I'm saying of the of the origin of the name is true or not, the story of Venezuela is certainly not a story that starts with love. I mean, it's a story or with with some sort of grand project. You know, Venezuela was a place that was uh, a indigenous community that had very hard access to oil, sorry, to gold and and precious metals because of the geography of the country. And so, whether Spanish settlers arrived to Venezuela, there was not a great uh, wealth to be exploited easily so that's why the, they kind of spread out across the continent please please correct me if i'm wrong they kind of spread yeah. spread out across the continent and kind of ignored this place that had no real major mercantile okay. value for them and so it's a very large coast coastline who was largely ignored and underdeveloped so it has been historically a country of pirates and i really think that this has a lot to do with the current present situation i mean it's like it, it projected towards the future i mean and then we reached to a situation when other colonies were much more much more profitable for Spain, and so Spain developed them further. And uh, you kind of reach to in a very fast forward from 1492 until 19. On, on, when was the discovery of oil in Venezuela? 1917. 1917. So if you make a very fast forward of those 400, uh, 500 years, uh, circa 500 years, uh, what you get is a it's a second grade child that was there left, you know. Uh, thrown somewhere and not paid attention by its papa and all of a sudden this child won the lottery uh, after gaining independence from his parents who said you know what fuck you i'm gonna move out of this house and i'm gonna and then he won the lottery and then it attracted major attention from other people from outside the world and then we kind of if we do that we kind of can easily fast forward to the 70s because i mean you now know that venezuela started as a very poor colony then it, it uh, slowly gained independence i actually believe that that's one of the reasons why the independence movement started there because it was just not a major colony so why would you put a major army there and something like that factor number one why venezuela is so weak infrastructurally it was not an important colony to spain factor number two factor number two venezuela was always a country of pirates kind of because of a large coastline largely unguarded uh, factor number three venezuela finds vast mineral riches eventually and attracts the imperial powers and it's already a weak state that started like that so mm -hmm. that's a parenthesis i wanted to do so now we have to fast forward to a point i will and, and before to set the background properly for you uh, this uh, wealth mainly <coughs> comprised of oil was nationalized in 1973 if i'm not correct uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah. 74, and I think, 74, yeah. yeah, it was nationalized in 74. So the meaning of that is that there were a lot of international companies, and then the government came with a gun and put it on the table like, "Hi, I'm gonna buy this, okay?" And the and the companies were like, "I mean, I'm of course joking. You can tell me better how that process was, but metaphorically speaking, I think that's how it was. It was like, okay, if you don't want me to sell me this, well, I'm just gonna shoot you or something like that, or I'm just gonna kick you out of this place." And then we got amassed a huge richness in the 70s, and that's where you were. And I think this parenthesis will help the audience to catch up a little bit on what's a brief history of Venezuela there. 
so uh, I give it to you back. Sure, sure, and I'm I'm happy to go back in the history Man. Again as we go through because it's 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 fascinating, and I do yes. believe it it has an impact on present events. Um, but well, I mean, let's 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 try to. <laughs> uh, we're we're talking about two subset of histories because we want to reach the we want to reach today what is happening today. Yes, but. Um, the, the fact is that in the 80s, the state uh, couldn't um, deliver on the promises it made to its citizens, or, or not, not only on the promises, but also on the expectations of, of the citizens, because the citizens saw all this wealth and they were not getting their, what they consider was their fair share. Yeah. And this, this process of long, uh, uh, slow decline came to an incredible uh, explosion in 1989. In 1989, in, in February 1989, uh, um, there was there there were massive riots in in Caracas and in other places around the country, protesting uh, against uh, several government measures uh, under the Washington Consensus. It was a liberalization process. And, and, and it's difficult to think as, as Venezuela as a socialist country back then, but basically, look what we had. We had price controls all over the board, mm -hmm. all over the board. So basically, Venezuela has been a, a socialist country kind of thing since its democratic well, inception, or? No, I, 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 I think uh, that, that's a, a, a deeper conversation, but... but um, the, the fact is that it has not been a country that embraces the free market at all. Yeah. Never. Well, the nationalization of the oil industry is not a very yeah, friendly yeah, yeah. free market move, right? Like, <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and the creation of state enterprises for everything. Everything had a state enterprise in Venezuela. So as the guide, 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 guide of this conversation, I want to make a check mark here. Venezuela has yeah. always been a big state country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big state and, and people in the Soviet Union would recognize characteristics of, uh, uh, of, of the, the state-driven economy that they were familiar with. Price controls, um, state enterprises, expropriations, um, the state being the majority owner of the land. The state owns all of the oil, which is the major source of rich. Nowadays, right? So, Nowadays, yeah, and since the well, it, it it always it was always the owner of the oil when it was underground. It gave concessions to private individuals to get it off the ground. When when the private individual got it off the ground, it was theirs, but they had to pay. Wow, wow! So and, so so it's a little bit like the electromagnetic electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, it's like uh, it's there. The government use it. You can use it. It's from the government, but you can use it. Yeah. Uh, see, yeah, and and when you use it, it's yours. Is it true that this has a back origins? By the way, I need to make a parallel, a little sidetrack here uh, about Simon Bolivar. Is it true that this has such back origins to that decree that Simon Bolivar made? Yeah. For those who don't know who Simon Bolivar is, uh, which would be strange, but Simon Bolivar was one of the major players in global history, and he was the person who liberated Venezuela, and he was the person who, well, or who led the revolution to the freedom of Venezuela, or whatever we want to call it, and uh, and he made a decree. Do you remember in which year it was? Uh, probably 1828. 1828, which was like, okay, everything that's under the floor of the, of the or under the ground is property of the state. Something like that is the correct way. Yeah. So, so that projected to the present in, and then generated the situation in which in present day there was this ambition, not ambition, but expectation that everything under the ground was owned by the government. Ah, and, and I want to tell you something. In Russia, there is an expression. I still don't know what's the origin, but in Russia, there is an expression which is like, he's tougher than Bolivar. Oh no! Way. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Way. yeah. My and wife and I. Regular? No, I don't think that my friends. You know, I mean, from the music in the world knows it, but okay. I, my wife told it to me in a point, and we researched it. We are not sure what's the origin because there is a horse. There's a horse in a character of a book, which I'm sorry escapes my mind right now. That it's uh, the horse yes. is called Bolivar, and maybe the people were referring to that horse, uh, and they don't know that they were referring to, to that the name of the horse okay. was given to him. So. 
to bring you back to speed we're in the 70s getting a lot of money no no but i i have to i have to to go back to bolivar one second <laughs> because there is a little known fact that bolivar tried to raise an army uh, with russia being one of its <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. After after the defeat of Napoleon and the Vienna Congress in, in Europe, there were three countries that created uh, a thing called the Holy Alliance. That it was the Austrians, the Prussians, and the Russians. And it was an alliance to protect conservative monarchies against liberal principles. And as they saw it, the Christian values and stuff. And Bolivar was super afraid that these people would try to reconquer South America. <laughs> and the Congress of Panama uh, was uh, an attempt to build an army having the Holy Alliance as one of the possible adversaries wow. for, for um, reconquest. Now that we're making some uh, side tracks, Russia, Venezuela connected, we have to speak about uh, Francisco de Miranda for a second. And Francisco de Miranda is one of our uh, like heroes of our independence. And he was very known to be one of the early Latin lovers of the history of uh, <laughs> of the world. And there is a very famous romance between him and Caterina the Great, by the way. So Venezuela and Russia were not just connected by my arrival to Russia. This is a very old thing. So <laughs> includes monarchy, monarchic uh, love affairs. Yeah. So yeah. We're back okay, in the eighties, the and there are we're the back explosion. in the eighties, and there are there are riots, and things are happening in Caracas. Uh, no, but it's 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 we we have we do have to to mark it as the point where you know everything uh, uh, like it's a watershed event. These these riots. It's called El Caracaso, and what happened was that people went on the streets rioting, protesting liberalization policies. So basically, it was, I mean, the, the stated um, policy of the moment was an increase of gasoline prices. But seriously, it would be a complete mistake to think that the riots were a direct consequence of uh, the increase in, in gasoline. It, it is the culmination of a decade old process of decline that uh, that just, you know, exploded there with this um Can we guide through? Places. Can we guide through the people that have no idea what what's the history of our country? Uh, I'm going to kind of direct this just to leave you intellectually where you are and not to f get you out of focus, but just to grab you one second there. Okay, look, the history in a nutshell, the history of Caracas, uh, Venezuela, sorry, has had a bipartisan system for until Chavez arrived, and well, the since the since the 60s exactly. Yeah. since the 60s and so Venezuela was largely ruled by a party called Acción Democrática and uh, I mean there was Cope as well but if I don't mistake if I'm not mistaken yeah. Acción Democrática held most of the power for most years so so you know Venezuela was always a country who A was exploiting the oil like we said before B uh, was r ruled by social social democracies uh, with large government and C um Well, it kind of was always a poor country. I mean, it's not that that that. I mean, well, no, that's that's not nuanced. But it deteriorated rapidly after the 70s. Coincidentally, after the nationalization of the oil industry, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. I wanted to say that because I mean, what people hear a lot when they discuss Chavez is like. Uh, we are here canceling the neoliberalism that, that brought this country to ruin. And uh, maybe you can be more detailed about that. But I want people to understand that Venezuela was kind of a social democracy from the 60s until Chavez came to yeah. power. And it, it never stopped being one. Exactly. Uh, and so... and so it, it has never embraced the free market. Like, Leo, why have you not... I mean, when we were growing up, what beer were we drinking? Polar. Polar. Yeah, we were drinking the, love, the Venezuelan beer. I love Polar. I love Polar. I mean, I, it's a great beer. It's, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. It's awful. I mean, I, I guess I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, yeah man. that's it. It's canceled. <laughs> Dude, no, I mean, I'm joking. Uh, carry on. So we were drinking Polar beer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's weird, right? I mean, why were we not also drinking Heineken? Or That's a good why question. Why were not also drinking uh, Colombian beer? It's because there was this massive tariff protection 
for Venezuelan industry. Massive, massive, massive. And and of course, I'm just making an example out of beer, but this goes all the way to to. Do you to think do, 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 those con, those con, that grip on the economy is started with democracy. I mean, it, it was preceded by the dictatorships that preceded the I, democracy, right? I really don't know much, I don't know much about the economic policies of the military dictatorships before mm -hmm. democracy. It's actually something interesting uh, to, to, to research. I don't know much about it, but I, I doubt that, uh, I, I don't think it was uh, market driven. Uh, it, it was pro. I mean, Perez Jimenez, which was the military dictatorship in the 50s, that got a huge infrastructure uh, uh, spending going on. It was government led. It was mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. uh, private sector led. But I, 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 I agree with you. It's something interesting to research. I yeah. Don't know much. Yeah. Okay. So let's carry on. We we are we are in a country who had this uh, big government approach, and in the 80s <clears> the the oil collapsed, and then the contract between the government and the people was heavily severed. Is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. And yes. So so back to this day of the riots in Caracaso, people went on the streets. In a, in a, uh, not, not in a protest uh, uh, spirit, but in a rioting spirit. And the response from the government was to send the army to the streets and basically fire at will. Ah. And in two nights, there are obviously, as in such events throughout history, there are different figures of how many people die. But you go from a conservative low of 300 people, Venezuelan people on the streets killed by its own army, to almost 2,000, 1,800. I, I, I remember seeing airplanes flying in front of my, I mean, like in the, in the field of view of my, uh, of my, of my window. Yeah, I was something uh, like five years old. Yeah, because my, my window overlooked all the city. Uh, and I know that airplanes were, I mean, I was super afraid. I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. So um, this this moment was uh, like the moment where the relationship between the government establishment and, and the people uh, got really severed. The leftist armed movements of 23 de Enero and, and, and different neighborhoods around Caracas were created after this as a self-protection uh -huh. uh, mechanism. And the military uh, had a little existential crisis. I mean, it's not that, I mean, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if existential crisis is the right term, but the fact is that um, three years later, or, or yeah, three years later, uh, the, the discontent that this event of uh, 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 repression generated led to the first coup d'etat led by Chavez. 1992. In, exactly. In February 1992. So and once again, once again, I'm just like, we're, we're drinking beers in a bar and I'm just helping in everybody who is drunk just to keep track of what's going on. Yeah, that's good. Poor country Where from the your house. Where in your house in Canada? <laughs> you brought some uh, Russian friends. I miss it so much. So, so poor country, big government, big protests in the eighties, a lot of blood. Nineteen ninety-two, random guy who was a member of the army tries to make a pull it up. Nineteen ninety-two. That's where we are. Yes, 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 yes. And he didn't do it alone. It was a, actually a very big movement, and. Um, you know, there were a lot of generals involved and there were a lot of ideological... Spoiler alert, involved. that guy was Chavez. We didn't say the name. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Hugo yeah. Chavez. Hugo Chavez. Exactly. He was a uh, lieutenant colonel, you would say? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, you yeah, yeah say, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. A mid-ranking mid officer of the army. And uh, his uh, mission was to take the presidential palace mm -hmm. um, and he failed. <laughs> and he was basically the only uh, military commander that failed in its mission that day. All the other commanders in oh. the coup were successful. Ah, okay, so he, uh, I didn't know that that key on the story. Was he the leader of that yeah. revolution or he was just I, one I of the pieces? He was, but every, you know, this is, this is very interesting. He claimed he was afterwards. The people that participated didn't agree. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so he was a piece he, of the puzzle. The 
he was a piece of the puzzle and then there was a situation which like Chavez you had one job to take the fucking governmental palace yes. and he and he failed okay i see well i mean it's a difficult job it's yeah difficult job. <laughs> to be fair I mean, yeah it's yeah. like the, the big <laughs> fortress right <laughs> but but that's the that's the image you saw of the tank hitting the door of the presidential palace <laughs> you remember that yes 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 <laughs> okay you can put it uh, uh, you can edit it and put it afterwards <laughs> yeah that would be funny that well, would be funny the thing is that uh, when the president i mean the the coup failed Um, they didn't get the president. The president escaped. The the high-ranking military officials stood by the president, so the coup failed. And when they were discussing um, what to do with with the with the failed coup uh, military officials, <laughs> the, the the worst idea in the history of the country occurred to someone. I don't know whom. And and the idea was, why don't we? interview in national television the the one of these guys that got surrendered so he can tell the rest of his group to surrender as well <laughs> <laughs> don't do that man <laughs> just 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 in prison then you know like just no national tv for them and and i i don't think that i don't think that putin will uh, take take uh, navalny <laughs> <laughs> to explain himself on national Russian TV. <laughs> no, and the, yeah. this would not be Navalny. This would be uh, I don't a Chechenian, know, a Chechenian uh, armed armed uh, militant. I, I, yeah, in, totally. One one of the <laughs> kidnapping events where where you yeah. had the, you know, uh, like just talk with your friends and tell them to stop. Like <laughs> he's going to scream what you don't want him to scream. That, that's a good for for those here tuning in. Like that that's a re really good way to under. I mean, I want to point you out how unserious Venezuela is. Just try to imagine that. I mean, uh, there was a Chechenian guy trying to take over the power, and then Putin will sit him on on Russia Ajin and and will take. Okay, just tell your friends to stop. And now, Daniel, you can tell us what did he said. Live, live on television, like not not recorded. Yeah, <laughs> because that's the worst part. I mean, you could have just fucking recorded it, but no. Uh -huh. Live on television, and what he said was, uh, you know, a moment that got enshrined in the popular culture. First, he took responsibility, you know, and this is something that we can talk about subconsciously in venezuela it's, it's it's i mean you were saying that it's a country of not serious mm -hmm. uh, people people that you know wander around our adventures blah, blah blah so taking responsibility is a big thing so he started by doing that my name is hugo chavez i take responsibility for the movement and we have for now not at, not achieved with our our objectives yeah but we will And and we will continue until we achieve victory. And, and, the, and, and the guy, the guy, <laughs> the guy on the camera behind, like, <laughs> okay, that's really yeah. funny. So we're no. 1992. We're 1992. There was a coup d'état. That coup d'état failed. The guy who gave the coup d'état was giving a chance to. I mean, major major political advertisement. Their national TV opened for him. Uh, so he said to the country, uh, "Alan Schwarzenegger, I'll be back." right yeah yeah and and we will win you know and uh, because the people of venezuela deserve better this has been a reason you know like, <laughs> like i have a question like i have a question because yeah. you see uh many of the i call them starbucks socialists uh you know claim that claim that uh chavez was them a lot. <laughs> well you're like surrounded by starbucks right uh, where you live so um So they claim that Chavez had, I guess, this kind of Marxist visions from the beginning. And I wonder, what do you think what was his doctrine in 1992? If you if you can address this question, like, do you think he had a Marxist I think, vision I don't or think he knew? I don't. I don't yeah. think he knew. I don't think he was he was clear. <clears throat> um, uh, I I actually think that his time in prison got him. Hmm. Uh, a little bit to the left i guess that the guy yeah, who gave him the fucking camera to her like hey why don't you read this book man dude yeah <laughs> no and they gave they gave him unrestricted access to all visitors he wanted i mean it was it was a crazy uh, why why do you think it it was like that i mean was he very already powerful inside this establishment no. or no 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 they no, were no, afraid no. maybe that the thing will <laughs> no, end up i think uh -huh. it's 
you know, it, it's one of these th things where Carlos Andres Perez just uh, wanted to to. I have no idea. Carlos Andres Perez. No idea. Carlos Andres Perez was the president of the time. Just for those who do know, the president that that received the coup. Exactly. Do you think that? Do you think that the the uh, uh, we make a little parallel here, guys? Uh, in in Colombia, there has been a historical conflict that many know <laughs> that, that, that led to a civil war and that started with the murdering of a populist leader. Do you think that the ghost of Gaitan perhaps would have led, led this kind of guy? Eliezer Gaitan was that leader. Uh, do you believe that perhaps that ghost? Was I mean that the poly the powers to be in the moment was like man don't cross this guy because the thing can end up how it actually ended up later, or just no idea. Uh, you you see what I mean? You understand the question, right? Like like I understand the question. Why would Carlos Andres think, Perez do that? Yeah. yeah. I I do think that the that the social structure be between Colombia and Venezuela is very different, mm -hmm. very very different. Um. In Carlos Andres Perez was a poor guy when he grew up. He was he was a common, uh, you know, son of, of middle class, from, low from, middle class uh, guy, or yeah, not even middle class, from, like from from nowhere, from Rubio Tachira. I mean, like, oh, um, okay, yeah, like it's, it's it's very far away. So 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 you don't have this. Let's call it, you know, oligarchic thinking in the in the minds of, of Venezuelan leaders in, in the past century because we didn't have that kind of society because the wealth in Colombia is uh, uh, you know your typical industrial pre-industrial uh, wealth distribution system of land capital you know your, your typical system but in Venezuela it was oil and, and it was the state so the oligarchy is the state yeah it's not uh it's not a set of families or <clears throat> uh, no, there is no actor in venezuela that can uh, um, challenge the economic power of the state even if they get together like it's and then this is a major source of problems for us of course because uh, basically it's a state that does not need society to survive therefore it doesn't care about society <laughs> that's like a good it, point <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so in, in all the countries of the world, except Petro states, except Petro states, the the government is interested in the economy thriving because it needs society to be productive in order for the government to get revenue. In Petro states, we don't have that. We don't care. And it, it has been I mean, historical like that in in our country. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Yeah completely separated from from society the wealth of the state is completely uh, yeah it, it's it's not a it, 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 it its revenues do not come from its people that's that's the point so so, so that severs the democratic relationship a lot and also I mean it's kind <laughs> of like the husband who the husband who is almighty in his house and then mistreats the wife because it's like ah whatever I don't need you I bring all the money yeah. You know, you're just irrelevant here. Just go to your room and fuck you, kind of. I mean, it leads to this kind of uh, relationship between state and uh, and, uh, and and go and and be and its people. So, so the coup that happened, Chavez. And, and ah, sorry, people, sorry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, go on, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. And and the relationship between the people and the state is that of son and father. It's not that of represented and representatives. <laughs> It's it's yeah. son and father. It's uh, give me, you know, and and son and father. When the son is a kid, it's kid and father. It's give me because I'm useless, and and you can give me, and 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 I'm going to depend on you. So so and if I am sitting in my yeah. once again in in in, uh, in my <coughs> nice uh, London uh, coffee shop, uh, reading about the the. Uh, workers rights and uh, socialist movements yeah. in the 20th century um, I would I would uh, imagine that Venezuela was this capitalist uh, wonderland that uh, the rich got very rich and the poor remained poor and then the Chavez came to save everybody from this yeah no no Chavez came 
uh, with a with that narrative, yes. <laughs> but the truth is that Chavez did a coup d'état in a moment of declining oil prices and the the massive um, um, disruption destruction of the relationship between the state and its people after these riots. Exactly. And when he got into power, I mean, he he started with that narrative. <coughs> When he got into power, he received the most important oil uh, 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 boom in the history of oil. There has never been a price increase of oil. Just a quick, moment. just a quick uh, historical comment for our audience is that for the people listening is that he got to power after he was in prison for a while. There is a president who pardoned him. Rafael Caldera, if I'm not mistaken, yes. who pardoned yes. him, and uh, and after he left prison, he started a political movement uh, that was called the Fifth Republic Movement. Uh, am I correct? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. and uh, and this, uh, did, would you consider that a, I mean, as democratic as it can be, a kind of democratic process it was uh, to reach to power. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So Chavez, and I, I think this is uncontestable. That's great. I mean, because uh, that's something that I, uh, that's how I remember my history, and and I, I, I don't know if I remember it correctly. <coughs> so he reaches power. He capitalizes on this uh, situation, and he lands on the biggest oil boom in history. What were the prices of? I remember one hundred dollars per barrel, something like that, close to that the year. Sorry, am I crazy? At one point it was. At Fuck, one point man. it was. Yes, between two thousand and seven and first half of two thousand and eight, and then from two thousand and twelve to maybe eleven to two thousand fourteen, it was around that. Yes, I mean it. It. it, it The, the 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 Venezuelan state got more than a trillion dollars in revenues in this uh, a trillion dollars of of two thousand dollars, right? Uh, of our dollars today, yes. uh -huh. mm -hmm. wow. more than a trillion dollars. I mean, that's that's just unimaginable. It's it's just it doesn't make any sense. I think that the whole I'm I'm, I'm I'm going to check this check this number now, but I think the whole economy of Russia. <laughs> Uh, it's a trillion dollars it's right now. More. No, it's yeah, it's 1.6. But anyway, I mean, it's 1.6. I yeah. mean, and this is a 150 million people country. Like, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's 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 crazy the amount of money that that they had, and also, and Russians can also see a parallel uh, uh, on this because you also uh, got an increase of quality of life on. On these years, based on the oil price um, uh, moving up so so much um, on these two decades, um, so we share Russia and Venezuela. We both share that since our main source of income and exports is oil, <coughs> we we ride together the roller coaster, like ne yeah. not necessarily on the same on the same boat, but. But parallel tracks. And yeah, there is a there is a factor. There, there is obviously a factor that differentiates us uh, apart from the million factors that differentiate us. But uh, I noticed, yeah. of, of course, being an empire before, as uh, we were before the Soviet Union, uh, as we were here, it makes a huge difference, right? Like, I mean, and, and I, I fight a lot with people here because, I mean, uh, I, I get a, I get a, a lot into these conversations, which is like, uh, look at our economy. We only make oil. Uh, no, sorry. Let me put it better. How it is? I describe the situation of Venezuela, and man, <laughs> this makes this makes my blood boil. To be honest, I describe the situation of Venezuela just like here, and I'm like, no, no. I mean, it's just not like here. I mean, we don't make boats, we don't make airplanes, we don't make tanks, we don't make rockets, we don't make trains, we don't even have fucking trains. Like, what are you talking about? That it's the same like here. Uh, anyways, but but I see your point. I mean, that that people who live in countries who have... And that's super interesting what you brought to the table because this relationship between the state and the individual, it's something that I feel here in modern Russia as well. I mean, there is this expectation which is like... I mean, of course there are variations but of the tone, but th there are this expectation which is like, well, there is a state who has the riches, the riches. It's not me who produces it, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this uh, <coughs> creates a very weird yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, yeah. social contract, right? Yeah, totally, totally. So, totally. so, so look, there, there <laughs> seem to have been like some sort of like 
quote unquote golden age of uh, Venezuela in a way I mean for Chavez rule sorry I mean in the sense that there was a time things are catastrophic right now and I always describe to my friends um, you know that the history of Venezuela is the history of digging uh, not a digging sorry of going down to the basement of the house and finding that the basement had a basement and then the, the basement of the basement had a basement and I mean just yeah. keeps going down and no no uh, where do you think that after Chavez is in power I mean things are were not incredibly terrible from day one am I correct do you share yeah. this impression or uh, yeah yeah <laughs> well, but but to be fair, I mean, the, the, the there is an event that we need to talk about, and I really want to you to tell tell me your personal story there. I mean, there was a attempt to knock down Chavez in two thousand and two, which was a famous situation, yeah. and so this is just three years in. Yeah, in, because Chavez became well, pa president in nineteen ninety nine. Uh huh. I mean, uh, Chavez became president. Uh, I mean, he won the election in 98, he assumed power in 99, same as Putin, by the way. <laughs> Putin in December, Chavez in February. <clears throat> um, and and in six months into, uh, less than six months, uh, three months into, into, into his administration, he uh, scrapped the the uh, democratic process as we had it <clears throat> because he installed the cons uh, constitutional assembly <clears throat> and this constitutional assembly um, uh, revoked congress like uh -huh. it said like the constitutional assembly is going to be the new <clears throat> uh, assembly of venezuela we don't need congress anymore mm -hmm. And and with this assembly, it was basically a, 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 a an institution of unlimited power, and they appointed the judges, they appointed, you know, the entire state bureaucracy from a new breaking with the democratic tradition and breaking with the constitutional tradition that <clears throat> that Venezuela had. And then, since uh, the year two thousand, uh, we had this new constitution. And then we go to, to this process of what you're talking about in, in the year 2002, which was uh, an, an organized society <coughs> push to get Chavez uh, out of power. And, and I do, <coughs> in the end, I, I will agree that the end of this process was a coup, but I, I, I do reject the characterization that it was only a coup. This was a massive national protest movement by civil society to get Chavez out of power for, you know, for for several days. For several for those days. for those who are just joining us or don't know the story or something, and we're talking about three years in the beginning of Chavez era. There was already a massive discontent because I mean people have this fan. Everything was a wonderland, and then uh, blah, blah, blah. So, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, what triggered all this, all this movement was, you know, like Chavez started breaking with the constitutional order, with, the, with this constitutional assembly. Then he controlled all the judges, and then he enacted a set of laws by decree, 49 laws by decree, uh, in which uh, he basically is regulating, uh, you know, like <clears throat> redistribution of lands and 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 several things, including the oil law, the the hydrocarbons law. And the, what what was new at the hydrocarbons law was basically this. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, a little bit going back started at the end of the 80s middle of the 80s the venezuelan oil industry now controlled by the state realized that they didn't have the financial resources to invest uh, in in the oil industry in order to maximize production in order to to produce as much as possible so they started a process of <coughs> opening up the oil industry to private investors uh, basically, the year of 2001, the, the law of 2001 decreed by Chavez was a reversion of, of this process of 
opening up to private investors and uh, and an attempt for the state to control again every little part of of the business and i do believe that that this had uh, the most important impact if you remember the first organized group that uh, was against chavez gente was, del uh, petróleo yeah gente del petróleo yeah so so just a quick quick <laughs> no, recap no, no. by the by the way uh, if you, if you were in my studio together i would of course serve you some water and stuff if you want to make a little break i don't know to go to get water or whatever yeah, like, let me get let me get water but i'll yeah. be back no it's not a break Continue yeah talking. yeah so um, <coughs> so i wanted to say that uh, no, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well if it, luckily it doesn't spread out by uh, by exactly. <laughs> by, well, so not not that, not that we know that virus is a, it's a fucker. It, it might. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Con considering everything that has been happening, who knows? Exactly. You never know. <laughs> Now it turns out that it's a it's a it's a, a computer virus. It was a computer virus <laughs> all the time. <laughs> that's why Bill Gates is. That's why Bill Gates is so interested in. Exactly. Exactly. By the way, there is a funny there is there's a funny joke which around going around the internet, which is that. Uh, How can Bill Gates keep us away from this virus if he couldn't keep viruses out of windows? You know, out of the... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's very good. What's happening in Venezuela with the coronavirus, by the way? We can totally jump. What's happening in Venezuela with the coronavirus? <clears throat> well, we were socially distancing from the world. <laughs> <laughs> for for 15 years or 20 years. Exactly. By the no, way... No, I mean... The... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. There, there is an average of seven flights from Europe to Venezuela. Uh, uh, there were uh, at the beginning of the year. In Bogota, you have 80 something uh, flights. So it's, uh, it's one order of magnitude difference of social distancing that Venezuela had between the rest. So there are cases, officially there are some, something close to 350 cases, something like that. Mm -hmm. We're, we we are sure that 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 there are more and the, and that the regime is lying as as usual. However, what is also clear is that this original social distancing uh, was very helpful not to get. You see, it it, it 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 was great. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah. you have a you have a cockroach at home, and then you burn the whole house, and then the cockroach <laughs> dies, and you're like, you yeah, we're great killing cockroaches. Hooray! <laughs> so, yeah. so it seems like it seems like we can separate the story, kind of. I, I'm, I'm thinking because I mean, right now people people have no idea how grave the situation is. I mean, because because uh, no. even I don't have an idea of how grave the situation is, and no. I'm from there. Um, yeah. If you could, if you could separate this in epochs from from 1999 until now, like 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 mm. I mean, what are those epochs? <clears throat> yeah. I would say um, year 99 to 2000, the break with the Republic and the creation of a new uh, structure. 2001, 2003, the, the civil, uh, massive Venezuelan people organizing in order to push back and try to overthrow the regime, which ended with... Uh, you know, a failed coup, a couple of failed mm -hmm. coups. Uh, then 2004 uh, to 2000, and, uh, I mean, 2004 was like the <clears throat> doubling down of uh, Chavez legitimacy because he actually managed to win an election that nobody thought he was going to win and that was a Uh, uh, a terrible process. Uh, then, from 2005 to 2007, the start of socialism, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, like maybe maybe dividing it like this without the context, it's a bit weird for the audience. But after <clears throat> after the failed coups, Chavez made uh, a pact with the devil called Fidel Castro. I don't know if you uh, know the, the name of. <laughs> yeah, of I heard about this guy. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean he he did a cool down in. in, in Aha! In the, so that's really cool. So we have a pre-Cuban yeah. intervention era. You see that that's a good way to piece it together. We have a pre-Cuban intervention era. So we get a new character into our <coughs> into our plot. 
after yeah, the devil <laughs> after after I, I never understood how Cuba was so powerful I mean considering it's the circumstance but whatever I mean so after after yeah, it's 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 what it's the same um, uh, it's this pact of your kingdom for this well it's it's your kingdom Venezuela for you staying in power mm -hmm. I mean that was the pact the pact was I will keep you on power if you give me as much oil as uh -huh. but but why what was the guy oh, <laughs> I answered my question my own self I was gonna ask you what was the guarantee that the Cubans could keep Chavez in power well they kept themselves in power for 50 years so they know how to do it oh, yes <laughs> like I mean they had an actual yeah. like you know <laughs> resume to show you know like hey we can totally do this so don't worry about it okay so so 1999 Chavez comes to power wins the elections uh, 2002 big attempt to remove him from power fails and that's Popular a attempt. yeah that's a, that's a super interesting episode and we can <laughs> talk for hours about that uh, and then and then uh, Chavez uh, re-emerges victorious in 2004 after that moment he makes a pact with Q1. A little bit before, a little bit before he right? made it mm -hmm. in 2003. He mm -hmm. made it in after the failed coups. I mean, 2004, the referendum of 2004 is part of, of the Cuban uh, ah, program uh, strategy. Yeah. When you, for you back then, uh, was it clear for you that Cuba was intervening mm -hmm. so early on, or this was something that you understood yeah. later? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was clearly a part of of of, of the discussion. Yes. And tell us a little bit of a personal story. Like, I mean, uh, you were in that 2002 revolution and you were, I mean, I remember your story of being, of covering yourself behind a kiosk of, of uh, newspapers and, and I mean, and being shot bullets that, that I mean, not yourself directly, but I mean, experiencing, am I right? Do I remember well? I was at the, at the protest. I didn't get to a point in which I could have been fired. Uh -huh. I got not, not fired, but shot. Yeah. <laughs> shot, yes, uh, fired at. Well, shot. Fired is not the word. Right. Yeah, uh, it's like that's a really brutal way to get somebody fired, man. It's like you're fired. Yeah, yeah. Fire, <laughs> fired from life. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I was not in danger of getting shot. I got like two blocks mm -hmm. uh, before. Uh, the place where people were getting shot but yeah i mean that, that was a crazy it was a massive uh, protest that we were going to the presidential palace to likely i mean it's funny because when if you ask us what we were going to do we were going to storm the palace and get chavez out like that that's basically that was the plan that, that was the yeah. plan <laughs> and um, there were i mean how do you call these uh, sharpshooters? Uh, there's some snipers. Thing. Snipers. Snipers. <clears throat> there were snipers. So they started shooting at people. Uh, the The story is actually very murky. It's not clear who controlled the snipers. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a murky, murky story. But in the end, what happened that day was that the the generals um, got together and asked Chavez for his resignation and put him in prison uh, <coughs> a new president uh, was chosen by these generals he uh, swore himself president of Venezuela out, completely outside the constitution like there, there there was no way this guy could have been uh, president under the constitution mm -hmm. and he dissolved parliament like it was a crazy day and then I think the generals got spooked by his um, ways and there was a counter coup and basically everyone was saying okay better have Chavez again than these crazy guys at this point do you think that Russia had any involvement in this <clears throat> no no zero no, no. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. no. Russia Russia was still <laughs> You know, put you you had the 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 Putin speech at the European Union saying like, oh, we, we want to be friends with you, uh, blah blah blah. The NATO, um, uh, the the NATO new members were not still uh, 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 inserted into the military alliance. That's where everything breaks down. Uh, it, it was. 
<clears throat> it was a long time from that. Yeah, yeah. So, so bringing us back to where we were, uh, we're trying to separate the thing into some sort of epochs because I mean the, the purpose of this first episode for me is kind of to to tie together this big story on how we ended up with a million percent inflation or more and a million percent devaluation and 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 so acute hunger and and so so <laughs> all right. Um, Uh, the coup that, that happens, Chavez uh, comes back to power. By the way, the general Garcia, Bel <laughs> Be Garcia Velázquez was the... Velasco. Velasco, Velasco. His daughter was in school with me and he came to us. This was such a loser move. Imagine, like we were just like 15-year-old kids, 16-year-old kids, and he came to talk to us about the fact that that, that, that was not a coup d'etat. And we we're like, yeah, we believe you, sir. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually remember. I was General like, of the army. and I, I, I like. It's not a secret that I voted for Chavez for many years, and I remember fighting the guy like there in the in the in the school. Like I was like, <laughs> and he came back home like this. 15 year old kid <laughs> seems like a hero of the nation, right? That he was engaging in a talk with me when I was 15 years old. Mm. So, so, <laughs> so packed with the devil, uh, 2004 ish. <laughs> and what about like what how was the economy in the first uh five years of chavez was it the same it was not Or great it was, not, it was great? not great oil oil prices were still depressed and uh and yeah it was it was really not great actually i don't know if you remember that chavez tried to get the army to do development work in infrastructure and stuff like because he didn't have enough money to pay private infrastructure companies he got the army to build uh, whatever things you know even selling chickens there is a famous thing of the army selling chickens and, <clears throat> and that's because they didn't have enough money to pay yeah uh, eventually they did and and they started having money and this is a good uh, point of the epoch in 2005 mm -hmm. so they consolidate um power in 2004 and in 2005 the ship uh, uh, starts this coincides starts. with if I'm not don't remember <laughs> if I don't remember incorrectly this coincides with a very aggressive foreign policy of Venezuela to work very closely with uh, the OPEC nations or the or well I mean uh, or it, it coincides it, with a geo geopolitical event I mean do you think this was a work of diplomacy or a work of luck no 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 it's China this is known ah. it's China mm -hmm. it's the demand from China the demand from China is just uh, massive uh, and and this new demand increased the price of oil I see okay so there is a geopolitical external event that pushes oil further so there's an oil boom again as you said 2007 we reached to some sort of like uh, uh, 100 dollars per barrel right uh, something like that and yeah. mm -hmm. um, and we produce three million barrels at that point how much we produce now four hundred thousand five hundred thousand at most So we went from producing three million barrels of oil a day to producing less than half a million. Yeah. Then, then uh, to <coughs> to we can fast forward a bit more to the present because I mean, eventually, in between, what do you think it happened? I mean, how would you call the era that goes after 2005? I mean, heading towards socialism. Uh -huh. That's when the socialism started. Because I remember an interview of Chavez. I remember an interview of Chavez saying like, socialism never. We will never be in socialism. People can yeah. find this interview online. I would happily yeah. put it on the description. Was, he was still not president. He, like, he was campaigning. Yeah, he was campaigning. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, when you're campaigning, you you say bullshit. And uh, yeah. yeah, so there is an oil boom, and obviously this rich, richness is mismanaged in between 2005. 2007 something like what what when do you think that oil boom ends it really ends in 2014 now ah, okay so it carried on till 2014 and he yeah. died Chavez died in 2013 uh-huh yeah well so he claims <laughs> so uh he may have died when in 2012 like i mean a little bit before there, there is there is a possibility but nobody really knows so. there is a very funny there is a very uh, for the audience that have never uh, uh, i'm sure uh, i'm sure most 
Salute, man. I, I'm sure most of the audience have no idea of this, but there was a very famous photo of Chavez being well with his daughters in a hospital and reading a newspaper. Uh, and there was a recent montage of King Jomun <laughs> because there was this uncertainty if he was alive or not. There was this very funny recent montage of King Jomun just chilling there with the daughters of Chavez, like, oh, everything is fine. So, so okay, Chavez dies. And why... Why the death of Chavez didn't produce a change in the status quo? Because, I mean, it seems like it was logical that, that okay, Chavez died. Here we go. We're going to get out of this. Like, was, and when, this, this question comes twofold, and it's kind of the same question. Was Chavez really popular with the people, or he had just a tight grip on the army? How do you see that? Oh, he was popular, and I would be popular if I had a trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, I always said that. <clears throat> yeah um, I mean um, the why 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 the status quo didn't change I don't think it's the right approach because I think mm -hmm. it changed um, I, I think that Maduro represents uh, the criminal takeover of, of the okay state. for the people who don't know Maduro <laughs> Maduro was historically the chancellor of Venezuela uh, am I correct? Yeah, he was uh, for for yeah, a long I mean, time. I mean, he occupied he occupied several positions in in the Venezuelan government. And when Chavez died, before Chavez died, he was appointed as the transition. Uh, I mean, I mean, as a new president, basically with the uh, I mean, with the task of uh, calling for new elections. Am I correct? And making a yeah. Okay, so now I need to tell a couple of stories before we carry on because. Uh, people think that governments are like Germany or like even though the German government can be a joke as well or like England or something like that even though the English government can be a joke but they just cannot imagine the level of mess that our country is and they really think that I mean that these people because when you read the news from outside you see that's the president who was elected legitimately it's like and then you as a responsible citizen you're like well, uh, we we don't want to when we don't like when countries just uh, you know when presidents are not respected and with uh, when the institutionality is not respected. So we, I person who sit in London, believe that he is the um, legitimate president because he was elected, something like that. <coughs> and so people need to start understanding something important. Venezuelan democracy is a, it's not even a fragile democracy. It's unexistent. It's unexistent since. I mean, I'm a little bit less radical than you, even though I'm nowadays full on. You know, I spend a lot of time not defending the regime, but I was more like in this little bit of like a leftist kind of kind of like, well, I mean, it sucks a little bit, but that's what the people want. Um, but there was a period in our in our history in which the government repeated a referendum to extend Chavez's uh, stay in power. And that was the moment when they lost me as a voter. If, if I'm not mistaken, that was in 2007. Am I correct? Or I don't remember the year. In 2007, we defeated the referendum. In uh -huh. 2009, they passed it. So, so I mean, for 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 if, to put it in the context of modern Russia, there is about to happen a referendum that will possibly extend the stay of Putin in power or for another term. Imagine that he loses that referendum and then he kind of repeats it how many years after it was two years two years after so so I, for me that's where the criminal takeover starts uh, i mean which of course with maduro it just yep. uh, uh, but people need to know that for example the president of the electoral commission has not changed since chavez came to power am i right or maybe there was like well since the year 2007 something like that yeah so so since the year 2007 the president of the electoral commission is the same until now and i i I was the I was always proponent of the idea that that uh, the authorities were not like kind of hacking the elections because they didn't need to. That that was always what I feel, and I would love you to destroy this impression if if you have to, if you want to. But there is a point where this was obviously not the case, and and that the authorities were pushing for for a uh, for a uh, apparatus which will secure their re-legitimization and so what we have in Venezuela is a usurpation of power it's like somebody who who takes control of the institutions and then without literally just 
counting the votes wrong. I mean, they are counting the votes. Maybe nowadays they don't count them wrong. I don't even want to enter there, but it's like they start the, the legion, uh, removing the capacity of people to run against the government. Uh, they start, like, like I mean, they create a parallel Congress, you know, which is a very important episode in the recent history of our country. And they, I mean, for people who don't know, there was... Even with the rig system, the opposition of Venezuela won a parliament with majority, and then the government created a parallel parliament. I mean, so, and then that's what the newsletter that is sent by the Venezuelan embassy in uh, in <laughs> Romania, it says something kind of like, no, well, according to our legal body, this is the official representative of the country, so that old parliament... So, I mean, what they have been doing is kind of slowly manipulating the rules of the game and sometimes not slowly, sometimes in your face, because things there are an absolute mess from the beginning. That's why I wanted to start this story with the way the colony was set up. You know, Venezuela was never a serious endeavor. And you project this to the 21st century, and so you have a situation in which, you know, because... I, I don't... Well, nowadays things are so different than when Chavez was alive, because, because I mean, Chavez had... And I and I, you may be you may correct me if you're you think I'm wrong. Chavez Chavez had some sort of level of integrity as a as a human being. I believe, even though he was deeply flawed and wrong, and maybe this changed over time. Maybe this was not always the case. Uh, maybe eventually, in a point, changed. But it was obvious that there was a moment when they understood that the populist support was not enough to keep winning elections, and so they started arranging the apparatus of the whole structure of the government and the society to make sure that that they will remain in power and to keep an image of legitimacy to the world and then uh, people like 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 i mean who are sitting in other countries outside just were looking at this and trying to say well i mean these people are trying to topple down the official government so they are playing with this image of what official means and they have been doing this by manipulating the constitution by manipulating the i mean by by, by manipulating the rule of law through the in, to the court of justice. I mean, there are cases that are ridiculous there. I mean, it's very hard for us to to tell to people in the world how they are rigging this game. And then perhaps you could tell me, because I mean, I, I'm this way disconnected from this. What are for you maybe the top three, and try to make it in as simple as you can and as uh, anecdotal as you can, the top three riggings that they did that are obvious and that people can go and check online and just download like a certain document that will show you like oh man look at what they did like what were what were some of the key uh, manipulations that they did to the legal body that that secure their stay in power and still gave them a chance to present themselves as legitimate <clears throat> okay um let's see first uh, and, and this is important because it was the takeover of the Supreme Court of Justice. When did it happen? <coughs> in 2002. Can you tell me, let, can you say this as if it happens in the USA? I mean, just put it as if it happens in the USA. Like, change the names sure. of the people and just say, okay, sure. imagine that. Sure. Uh -huh. So the House of Representatives <coughs> decides that the US Supreme Court should not have uh, only nine members, but that it should have 32 and that a majority vote of the House of Representatives is enough to appoint them, to appoint them, and it doesn't matter what the Senate. And how should this change be if it's going to be done legally? Well, I mean, uh, you you would have to modify uh, the Constitution. The qualified, the, no, well, I don't know, but you would have a qualified majority in Venezuela to appoint judges. You needed two thirds of the um, of the votes mm -hmm. of Congress. And uh, they elected them uh, with a simple majority, with 52% of, of the votes. Uh, the argument being, uh, it cannot. Uh, we cannot wait until we have two thirds. We need a, a new Supreme Court. Like, <coughs> whoa. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> but how, why can't they wait? I mean, what was their argument? Well, I mean, they couldn't. They were very rushed. <laughs> I mean, like it's it's that's where it started. So once again, once again, it would be as if this, the the House of Representatives in the USA bypass its own its own rules and then yeah. adds new Supreme Court justices. And what were they elect them? Like what was England and America saying at the time? I mean, was it like oh no, that's nothing, nothing. No, no, they couldn't care less. I mean, and and that's the thing that that. <clears throat> You know, I, I do believe that, that 
uh, it's important that that each country, the people of each country, can point these issues and care about other countries because because not not because of a philanthropic whatever <clears throat> uh, but because it can happen to you <laughs> it can clearly happen to you i mean uh, i am going to push for a deep human rights and uh, rule of law protection foreign policy of venezuela and that means that venezuelan embassies will <clears throat> uh, you know uphold the human rights uh, international obligations of each state because um, uh, because we didn't have that and it would have been very different if we did can it, you please can you please repeat this i didn't understood so well i mean if you were in power you would do that i understood you correctly and what would I, it be I that would, thing i would i would direct my ambassadors to point to human rights violations and violations of the rule of law in the different countries where the embassies are located. Having a deep <coughs> human rights um, uh, foreign policy of upholding the international obligations of its state. Uh, Can you tell me an example? How would, would that work? Like, I mean, if there is a, a, a state-led massacre of refugees in in Myanmar, we would point that out, and we would uh, select the ambassador to bring a note of protest to the government of Myanmar based on their violations. So and he, historically, that historically that was not happening. <coughs> well, it didn't happen to us. That's my point. I mean, all these ah, events that that happened in these two decades. We're completely. So the, uh, you mean that the, the, the ambassador of England was, of, or the UK was there sitting on the, on his uh, office and never issued a. Com well, I mean, I, I know that they issued communiques because this is a long story, but in many cases they overlooked some things that were really grave and that they should have pushed the international community, like, hey guys, I'm on the ground. I mean, imagine, then again, imagine if the House of Representatives just selects. The majority of judges without any uh, uh, measure of, of rule of law without any measure like they just Pelosi just stands there and says you know we have the majority of the votes of the House of Representatives now we're going to select this new 15 judges they're all liberal and Democrats they're anti-abortion they are uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, no anti-abortion no sorry <laughs> pro-abortion they're, pro, yeah. they're, they're you know, like all, 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 all the progressive agenda, and, and this is it. It's ours. Done. Blank. And 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 yeah, probably some countries are going to be like, oh, we're very much uh, uh, preoccupied by. It. But it's like, <clears throat> of course, it's not also the the responsibility of other countries to to point this out. But <clears throat> this was an extremely grave issue and it was swept under the rug. This was into, was into uh, once again, in which year it was? Once again? 2002 or 2003. One of ah, this was, does this preceded the the people of, I mean, the, the, the protests that were trying to topple down the government or, or was after? <clears throat> I think it was after the first attempt. Uh, mm -hmm. This, no, I'm sure it was after. Uh, this was probably 2003. Man, I don't remember that. Like, I mean, because I also disconnected it, but I don't remember that. I thought there was, a, because I remember there was a further, I mean, okay, so back, 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 back to the people mm -hmm. who are just trying to catch this and understand how this worked. Very early on the government of Chavez, there was this situation in which the Congress kind of modified over, bypassed the constitution and modified the Supreme Court. And this and, not only- and took over the Supreme Court, yes. And so that taints, you see, I mean, I, as a Venezuelan, if, because I mean, I'm a musician and I really, I'm an ignorant in all this. I mean, I just uh, know what the layman no knows. Even I, who is, is from this country, was ignorant of this till the day. I mean, not ignorant, but perhaps it just slipped my memory. And so this totally taints the, um, the democratic aspect that the Chavez government had. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So, so... Chavez died, and then the status quo doesn't change. Uh, well, I mean, you said that the status quo changed because the government became uh, officially, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you called it a... Uh, 
you, I really like the word you said. Uh, the criminal takeover. Aha, uh-huh, criminal takeover. And and I then I want to share with you a theory I have, and I want to hear your opinion. Because in the middle of all of this, I mean, because, man, to any Russian listening to this, even, I mean, please stop thinking that Russia now <laughs> is like Venezuela now. But just please stop doing that. And don't tell me that again if you find me somewhere, because it, it will really ir- irritate me. Okay? Uh, secondly, you need to understand that Caracas has one of the highest murder rates in the world. So, I mean, in the middle of all of this, if not, I don't think it's the highest, but it's, it's so if you go and Google right now, top, the most dangerous cities in the world, you're going to get something like six or seven Venezuelan cities. I mean, it's not only Caracas, it's crazy. And so in the we are trying to introduce to you the perspective of two venezuelans who were on the phone since they were 15 years old discussing this like with super profound passion and who saw the deterioration of their country from the point that we were living together and being in in one society to the point that everybody left who could and even who couldn't leave left as well and had to walk from caracas to peru it's crazy and it really happened it was a slow motion <coughs> civil war and with all this introduction that I'm giving, I want to introduce the topic of the control that the armed forces have of the narcotics in Venezuela, which is a very famous case and situation. And I want to hear, because I have a person who knows a little bit more about this, I'm going to introduce <coughs> a very, very naive and personal theory that I have always discussed when I'm drinking beers with my friends and talking about Venezuela. I think that there is something connected with the fact that the Plan Colombia was established in Colombia and that exporting drugs from Colombia became really difficult because uh, Colombia and America have a project which is called the Plan Colombia, which I don't know how it goes until the present, but when Bush was president, it was something around the $3 billion a year on military aid. And if I'm not mistaken, this still is happening. Am I correct? Yeah. So this means that pulling... uh So this means that pulling out drugs from Colombia became increasingly more difficult. And Venezuela and Colombia share a gigantic border that is absolutely impossible to patrol because it's just rainforests and mountains. I mean, it's it's just really hard to patrol. So there was this latent potential there always going of taking a hold on this incredible amount of money that it's involved in exporting these drugs out from Venezuela to the world. And uh, I want to ask you if you think that this plays any kind of role. I mean, this uh, conspiracy theory that I have about the Plan Colombia. No, it's not a conspiracy Uh theory. It's clear. It's an an analysis that I share, and I think the the establishment political analysis shares. Uh, And and there is an added factor, which is the alliance between Chavez and FARC. Uh Tell me about this. Well, the, the FARC is a communist guerrilla, was, or is, who knows, was a communist guerrilla movement that had been fighting to overthrow the Colombian government for six decades, <clears throat> 50 years. And, uh, um, and Chavez uh, made an alliance with them uh, in order to support them logistically. Why, uh, why would you do that? I mean... What, what do you think, I mean, apart from the ideological perspective, what was the military gain there? What was the strategy, do you think, if there was one? Uh, or it was just ideological? <clears throat> I, I think there is a, a pragmatic um, uh, side to this. I, I was reading a lot of what... Uh, there is a guy called Rodriguez Chacin, which is the key player in this. Uh, he was very close with Chavez. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah. Ramon Rodriguez Chacin. He was a Navy uh, Special Forces guy and he patrolled the borders. And I think that besides ideology, this guy actually managed to convince Chavez that having an alliance with FARC was going to be better than not having one because it's so difficult to patrol the border. Mm -hmm. So... Since it's so difficult to patrol the border, if you have an active engagement, a military engagement with them, you're going to drain all your resources. So it would be something like Trump (laughs) making a deal with the drug cartels in Mexico. Well, I mean, I I, I wouldn't go there. But in the end, what happened was 
that FARC was the major exporter of cocaine from Colombia. So this alliance with Chavez actually made it more possible, not only what your theory is saying, that there is this huge border that it's impossible to patrol, but besides that, you made an alliance with the main exporter. So you had the own patrol border with an alliance with the main exporter, and the Venezuelan army, basically what they did was to give safe passage. But they, 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 they got a percentage out of this, and that's the definition of narcotic tra trading. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the allowing the transport of narcotics. So it's not like the Venezuelan state was growing narcotics, growing no, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It was, it was not this. It was that they allowed safe passage of drugs from Colombia to the world through Venezuela. Mm -hmm. They got a cut out of this and that makes them uh, complicit in the narcotics trade. Is there is there any ev I mean because I, I I because I'm Venezuelan and I have been there and I have I have uh, seen a military trying to get me to trying to plant me personally drugs in my car. I mean <laughs> for, for for those for those who cannot imagine this because they think that Venezuela is Germany, you're just like you are the one who is in drugs. Venezuela is not like it Germany. I mean, I once had a cop stopping me and telling me Uh, I mean, the cop. The cop was searching my car, and I mean, I remember he opened my wallet and was throwing all my credit cards. I mean, we can make an episode just about encounters with the police in Venezuela because that would be hilarious. Like, and so just throwing all my cards, bank cards, and things in the car, like, and just, just like uh, looking at all my me and telling me like he he found a photo camera in my car, and he was like he put it on his pocket while he was looking at me, and then I was like, man, like 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 what's going on here? And he was like. And he told me, yeah, you now are a lawyer. And I was like, no, 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 man, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I just uh, don't know what's going on. You're searching my car. You're taking my possessions. What's going on? And the person told me, listen, man, you know how they call me? And I was like, no, dude, I don't know how they call you. They call me the magician. And I was like, uh-huh, okay, Mr. Harry Potter. So what should I do about this? I can make anything appear in your car. So you better shut up and just do as I say. And yeah, well, this is uh, just an anecdotal story of one person. I swear to you for my mom that this happened to me. And you have stories like that. And we all have stories like that. So, I mean, people are... I mean, Russians can understand this very well because the relationship with the law here was... I, I mean, I have a very controversial opinion about Russia. And we would. this would be a big theme in my... Not controversial, but I mean... I, Russia is changing and the mentality of people is changing less fast than Russia is I have and I can see it easier than them because I'm sitting here as a newbie and I I can feel the change faster people are you accustomed to the old ways but I myself have seen how the police here has become way much more institutionalized than what it was six years ago everything has become way much more institutionalized the making of documents the making of of, of everything everything is still a little mess but but it's certainly not to the level of our country so so what people cannot understand is that something mm -hmm. like the military well russians can understand it but english people german people are hard to understand that a military patrol border will just get a commission from exporting cocaine from a <laughs> art <laughs> from an art group <laughs> that, that, it's, that, it's for us we laugh because it is absolutely our normal and it is how and that that this whole detour from our story it's absolutely important because and and you know and it connects very nicely with something that you said before which was about the social contract i mean the the the, the relationship between the authorities and the transport of drugs became so intense that they even stopped the painting of oil and that's maybe i'm kind of joking but that's maybe one of the reasons even why the oil industry collapses i mean because We don't even need it anymore. I, I'm really half joking here because there is a really important thing that I want to talk about to you, which is about the nationalization of the oil services industries and the nationalization of the oil industries. Because that's, if we're gonna, do you understand what I'm talking about, right? Am I, did I say it correctly? Because for me, if in my understanding of the whole thing, that's the inflection point that takes us to where we are now, the nationalization of the oil services industries. For those who have no idea <coughs> what I'm talking about, and you're going to be able to say this a million times better, uh, when you make an uh, extraction of oil, there are essentially two kinds of industries. Uh, one that is dedicated to the actual extraction and transportation, and the other one is in charge of keeping that oil well in good condition. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing the infrastructure necessary to service the oil. So you have... 
so these were nationalized in 2006 am i correct no a little bit later the, more more to the tune of 2009 yes and so so here you got it i mean venezuela nationalized the oil industry in 1970s <clears throat> and then but what it nationalized was the transport and extraction not the servicing of the oil wells and this kept the oil wells in a certain way healthy and productive because this servicing was being done by french and german corporations am i correct uh french and german uh, and american Hollywood and, and yeah and so the oils were kept productive and we were producing three million barrels of oil a day so but then i think well and here's where you come in and you can help me out a lot because of for ideological reasons because i mean somebody whispered to chavez in the ear that this had to change this changed and that sent us to hell is it right is that a right impression mm -hmm. I mean, I, I am sure it contributed. I don't know if it's the defining factor. Mm -hmm. it, it clearly contributes because everything that, that has been taken by the Venezuelan state then collapses. So so basically, what where, where this was extremely grave was in the Lago de Maracaibo, in the Maracaibo Lake region, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, a lot of oil was produced. And after the nationalization of the uh, services industries there, it really collapsed. But we, we had all the oil fields of eastern Venezuela and the Faja Petrolifera del Orinoco, which is the biggest hydrocarbon basin in the world, like the hydrocarbon basin with the highest reserves in the world. It's crazy. <clears throat> so, so there is where we are still producing a little bit. Uh, but I agree with you. After the nationalization of the services industry in the Maracaibo Lake region, everything went went downhill very fast. Um, I, 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 uh, let's see. Um, I, I just think that the world knows that Maduro is not a reliable partner and that investing in Venezuela doesn't make any sense unless what you're after is different than just making money or if your risk um, uh, appetite is just uh, uh, outside market uh, surveillance. You know, if, if you can pull it out, uh, I mean, if, if you're investing in Venezuela, uh, it means that you have an extremely high risk uh, uh, tolerance. And yeah, and there there are two people who 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 can pull this off. Uh, uh, people that don't need to get new debt to make the investments, because if you get debt, then the the bank or institution that is going to lend you money is going to see the, you know, the credit worthiness of the, of the venture and investing in Venezuela is minus infinite uh, in terms of credit worthiness. Or if what you're after is, uh, different than making money uh, just political influence political control uh, a different kind of, of interest which is what i think happened uh, with rosneft after uh, 2010. when when does russia becomes a player in in the region uh, <clears throat> in the region I, I don't really know in venezuela you can clearly see two moments before Chavez and after Chavez. And before Chavez, it was a heavy military relationship in the sense of Russia providing military equipment to Venezuela. Before Chavez's death or before Chavez's uh, arrival to the scene? No, 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 no. Before Chavez's death. I mean, uh -huh. before, before Chavez ever, Russia played no No role. Yeah, role exactly. In, exactly. Yeah. No, no, I'm talking in in chavez presidential term several terms um he actually struck a deal a military deal with russia to to basically get two things that i think are important to talk about one is a very advanced um uh, aggressive attack capabilities of airplanes sukhois yes and also very advanced defense of the air capabilities, which is the S-300. Mm -hmm. It's an anti-aircraft, uh, an anti-missile 
Um, Battery unit, system. like yeah, land to yeah. land to uh, sky. In that but moment, they are extremely uh -huh. advanced, mm -hmm. extremely advanced. It's high, high quality uh, Russian uh, equipment. In that moment, do you think that there was a? I mean, uh, well, I guess that you just don't, you just don't like uh, sell weapons for selling weapons, kind of thing. I mean, wait, we have a issue here. Just a second. Yeah, we're back. Yeah. So I guess that um, you just don't sell weapons for selling weapons kind of thing. I mean, uh, was Russia always aiming towards a geopolitical position in Venezuela as a strategic partner? Because I remember yesterday on off air, I was telling you this theory that I have that was very stupid and very easily demolished, which was like, well, I mean, this is almost like a crisis missile 2.0. And you were like, man, come on, like you can just put a submarine in international waters. I mean, in front of New York and that's it. Um, <clears throat> what do you think was Russia seeking for? I mean, just influence, it's obvious, right? There is nothing, or is, I, is there the something? I think, mm -hmm. it, I, th I think it was, at the beginning, uh, a light political uh, uh, relation um, and a heavy commercial, military commercial uh, interest. Uh, because the Sukhois were several billion dollars, and, and we actually... Venezuela still owes Russia uh, bilateral debt out of these military cells. Um, I think it's uh, around 13 billion dollars or something. It's really large. No, number. No, 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 ah. no, 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 at all, mm -hmm. at all. It's a lot, lot less. It's, okay, a uh, little bit less than three billion. Ah, okay. <laughs> 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 That makes it nicer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so I, I think it was it was um, commercial. Okay. It was I mean geopolitical in the sense of getting a new military buyer in the region uh, that is seen as the region of interest of the United States. I, I, there is a geopolitical side to this. However, it's mainly uh, just to sell your equipment and. Yeah. And, and, and make money and maybe uh, try to get, you know, a long-standing um, uh, relationship with this new buyer. Actually, it was Chavez who approached the deal because the United States, our, our airplanes, our military airplanes, we have always had the best Air Force in Latin America, by far. Like, there is, uh, even, even today, in, in a one-on-one -on -one match with Brazil, we, Venezuela would win if, 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 if. If it's not football, what we're talking about. If, if we have, if the planes have gasoline or, or <laughs> I mean, like, if it would, I mean, like the the equipment that Venezuela has had in its air force, it's just, um, it's it's part of a dominant strategy, and and uh, and I believe that. But dominance, uh, do, can you explain me? I mean, I just cannot imagine what Venezuela wants to dominate. Our, our neighbors cannot deal. Our neighbors cannot deal with us if we want. I mean, if, if it was, is this the case nowadays? I mean, if we were had a I mean, confrontation with no, Colombia, nowadays mm -hmm. no. But but the Sukhois, yes. With the Sukhois, they cannot do anything. Uh, uh, is this the Colombian Air Force superior than ours, or or they is cannot do anything about it? They, like they they would be like little birds with an eagle. Like it's. I have become such like a. I mean, I of course have mixed feelings because Russia. I mean, is kind of hel helping perpetrate this, but I have become some such a proud kind of. Russian citizen that I'm like, yeah, we make great airplanes. <laughs> Russia, <Pedro. You> do. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's controversial, of course. I mean, and and and, and I don't no, see no, it. No, I mean, I don't. See, I, I I'm not naive about these things. I mean, this is a game of risk in the whole world, and uh, and uh, I understand the moves that the Russian government makes towards Venezuela, and uh, I mean, they they go against my personal interests, but. But it's like, for example, I don't want war, but I really understand why Russia gets involved in Syria from the Russian perspective, and why I mean, these all things make sense, and so. So and that that's where I want to get because the the so the the clear thing here is that it was not the relationship between Russia and Venezuela that changed; it was the circumstances of each country that made it necessary to change this relationship first yeah. and and this is why i'm talking about the airplanes it's that the airplanes that the venezuelan air force had were american airplanes f-16s 
and our neighbors couldn't stand a chance against these airplanes. Actually, this was proven in, in almost battle in 1986 with Colombia. No. Like they, they tried to... But Colombia to, Colombia didn't have an Air Force of, of, with F-16s and things like that? No, 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 no. No, but like, I, literally they didn't have anything. I have the impression that it's a richer country than Venezuela. So why they have such a poor uh, Air Force? It's not a richer country. It's not a richer country we have always been richer a lot like orders of magnitude i mean in, obviously you're yeah, when you say richer that we, yeah when you say richer you're saying in, in terms of the purchasing power of the government because i mean the person yes, yeah yes. the purchasing yeah the, the purchasing power of the standing citizen i mean i think i have the impression that colombians are in a, a little bit of a better situation than us not only in modernity but in the but last now, uh -huh. now since <laughs> since the last since the last what eight years mm -hmm. i mean not before that has it been because colombia improved or becomes venezuela deteriorated so bad or no, both no, because venezuela deteriorated no 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 the venezuela deteriorated so bad like if if we would have both uh, i mean if our if our I mean, the thing that people don't get is that in five years, we lost 70% of our economy. That's something that it, it's, it's yeah. just... Five million people escaped the country and we're a 30 million people country. I mean, five million people escaped the country in the past five years. Like, the, the amount of destruction of Venezuela in the past five years is unheard of. It's literally unheard of. I actually, I posted and, and, back back in the day. I posted a comparison between Swe uh, Syria and Venezuela's collapse, and it's comparative without the military destruction. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And 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 ours in terms of economic, it's bigger. In terms of economic yeah. destruction, it's bigger than Syria's. It's crazy. It's a it's a crazy situation. So so I mean that is why. But uh, but we have always been, uh, and, and especially the government has always been richer than the government of Colombia. So that's why right. we could have a dominant strategy. In the year 1986, they tried to infiltrate a boat in our uh, territorial waters, and we sent the F-16s, and they, they had to they had to just obviously went went north. I mean, like go away because there there was nothing they could do. Nothing. And so you were saying, so, uh, uh, I'm bringing sorry, the American sorry. airplanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm bringing this because uh, one of the sanctions that the United States did against uh, against uh, Chavez was to forbid the sale of military equipment. To yeah, I see. And obviously, Russia was like, "I'm here," you know. <laughs> uh, no and, problem. And it's an opportunistic. It's an opportunistic thing. But it's clear, as you say, it's, uh, like, uh, how can you, how can you not do it? How can you say, like, exactly? I mean, it, it, it was opportunistic, and it was Chavez took the 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 chance to have this alliance, and and it's done. And actually, it's not done that well because one of the things that that we bought, well, the government bought uh, a lot from Russia were helicopters, and we have had a major issue of those helicopters falling down. Major issue. More than nine of the helicopters have fallen down. It's when, a crazy, crazy when, when you buy a helicopter, I, maybe you don't know the answer to this, but I'm curious. When you buy a military helicopter and it falls, do you get some sort of money back? or? Well, I would expect so. I would <laughs> some expect sort of insurance? So. or? Yeah, I would expect so. I really I really don't have a, an idea, but I guess. <laughs> and, and, and I guess that the Russians are going to say that it was a pilot mistake. Right, right, but, right, right. But then, you know, like, what... what what point does it have to have these helicopters if we don't get the pilots to have it? Like you, sh you should have also a learning mechanism and not only selling of equipment. But whatever, that's a different story. The thing is that because the Americans decided not to, I mean, to forbid military sales to Chavez, and specifically, as specifically to serve the F-16s. Um, Chavez had to to go to Russia, and, and then uh -huh. yeah, go. No, 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 no. no. I, I, there ahead, is a ahead. point of the Russian change. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I have nothing to say. Yeah, it's it's February 2014. It's it, like this is as clear as water. So Chavez died in 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 theory in March 2013. The relationship hasn't ha changed that much. In 2014, after the. Um, 
the events of Ukraine and Crimea and uh, and all that and all the sanctions from both European Union and the United States, Russia um, uh, geopolitical calculus had to change. Of course, and it had to go into the offensive, and it had to go into the offensive. I mean, as you say, this is risk. Like this is not like if if, if you're playing risk. And then you see that South America is not guarded. <laughs> you go and take you go the South America. Yeah, exactly. You go and take Venezuela. I mean, you go like it's, it's. You take Venezuela. Why would you take Venezuela? Because Venezuela is great. No, Venezuela only gives you two soldiers. You want Asia. Exactly. You, exactly. You, you, you don't want South America. You want Asia. But but if you have South America and North America is there, you can tell the the, the North America at risk. I will trade Venezuela. If you get your people out of hmm. Europe, hmm. and 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 then we can, um, and then we can trade. Hmm. And and for me, this is the key insight of. of I have never, I had never seen it. Yeah, I have never seen it. It's a very good for one. For me, the key insight is that Russia, Russia's um, involvement in Venezuela, is not about Venezuela. Russia's involvement in Venezuela is about geopolitical global uh, uh, strategy and you know it serves them uh, uh, extremely well supporting the maduro regime gives them several things one is the ability to communicate to the world that the hegemon you know the the the, the world hegemon and the and the and the regional hegemon They wanted to have a political outcome in their sphere of influence, and we Russians are uh, uh, not allowing them to do so in this faraway place. Yeah, like they are completely defenseless. They are. They are. They are powerful. No, you know. You know. Powerful. You know. I would like to make the ar argument a bit more sophisticated. I, I have a feeling that that I mean the the structure of what you said in my opinion is a hundred percent accurate, uh, but the um, instead of presenting Russia as the power that can sort out the problems in such a faraway land, that's not what this government wants to show. What this government wants to show is like we are the preservers of institutionality because we want nobody to mess with our institutionality. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. we don't like I mean yeah. because because I mean everything works here in the same way in the following way if you mess you just don't mess with us like you don't mess with us because we're and, and don't mess with us and look we're playing a fair game kind of like and 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 I think that that's why it, that's obvious like a, a narrative I mean it's as you have a guy like Assad in Syria which I mean has not a very nice democratic record but the argument of Russia and that's that's something that in a way I 100% understand the argument of Russia is Assad even though he's a not elected president he is the president so he must stay there yeah yeah and it's it's the same uh, it's the same here in, yeah. in the sense of trying to stop regime change uh, yeah. but in case it's not uh, in a it's not only in a faraway place it's in the zone of influence yes. of the uh, worldwide hegemon so it's 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 meat you know it's it's lomito yeah it's it's, it's 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 like delicious meat there it's perfectly waiting for your, for you to take it like it's delicious i i Yeah, I think that. So, <clears throat> carry on. Sorry, carry on, please. No, 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 no. I mean, just, just to, to. Um, I, I, I would like to say what I, what I think, uh, uh, what I think Russia is getting out of supporting Maduro. First, as you say, is uh, this communication narrative of. I can stop regime change, which is not institutional, and I can do it in the zone of influence of uh, 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 my geopolitical adversary. Second, and, 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 and this is clear, is that by supporting this regime that the hegemon wants to change, I have leverage to negotiate with the hegemon for another worldwide... Yeah. Yeah, that I had never yeah, thought about. I had never thought about that till today. Yeah, that's a really important point. Yeah. 
So they, what I think, and, and I don't think Maduro realizes this, is that they are cooking Maduro. <laughs> they are cooking Maduro to deliver it. Yes, of to course. deliver him, but, but they're not going to do it for free. They're going, they, they want something in exchange. Um, in, in the impeachment proceedings here in Washington, uh, the, the leader of the National Security Council for Russia that it's called Fiona Hill. You know, when you she, when you started saying this idea, the beginning of the it got caught a bit because of the communication. Could you start again? Just in what commission I can? Yeah, in the impeachment uh -huh. proceedings mm -hmm. against yeah. President yeah. Trump. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the one of the witnesses was Fiona Hill. Fiona Hill was the leader of the White House for Russia, mm -hmm. and she explicitly said this uh, thing about Venezuela, <laughs> that uh, the Russians approached them to negotiate Venezuela. Oh. Venezuela. <laughs> yeah, but but of course, I mean, that's what, what the Russians are going to do. They're going to ask for Ukraine. And the Americans said, you know, fuck off. Like, uh, uh, we're not doing that. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's this mindset of, I am putting this piece here to get leverage to take something from yeah. you different from this piece like it's it's it could be it could be the new intermediate range missile treaty it could be satellite sure. weapon programs it could be whatever you want you know it's just it gives how, you leverage how would let's imagine a fall of the of the current status quo in venezuela and a transition towards uh a new a new line of government how do you think the relationship between russia and venezuela would be well i to tell you the truth i would like it to be the best relation possible because if we're grown up enough we understand that this was a risk move i mean risk there are no feelings as we yeah. know right yeah so uh why 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 would we go into vengeance mode like no i mean uh we you know leo venezuelans we did this to ourselves It, like the destruction of her country cannot be blamed on Russia. It yeah. cannot be blamed on Cuba. It cannot be blamed on the United States. It has to be blamed on us. And if we are not grown up enough to to be able to see that and 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 and, and see that clearly, we're not going to be mature enough to solve the challenges that our country has into the future. So the relationship I would like to have with Russia is a very respectful, commercially oriented uh, 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 relation in which uh, it's a mutual beneficial relationship and, and that's it. I think, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that the future government will honor the contracts, like, I mean, the oil um, positions sure. that Russia has there. I mean, for me, that's pretty obvious. Maybe in the of future, the, the military hardware will change for obvious reasons. I mean, because most likely we will align. I mean, I, I expect the future government to align to the United States. I mean, it's just an obvious. But anyways, that's outside of our of our field of conversation. And and. Um, And uh, I'm just really, really, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say that concerned is the correct word, but, but as a, as a Venezuelan that lives here and as I, in my own personal interests, uh, I mean, I would obviously like to see our, our countries having a synergical relationship and, and that's something that would be amazing. I just don't know what the geopolitical future holds. Yeah, man. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you can you I think that we're we're getting close to the two hours so that's uh, kind of what's my mark and it's a very interesting and exhausting thing as well I'm realizing this as I do it the first time I would like you to I would like to close this with a bit of a I want to get your take on what happened in the last days I mean there was this and also I mean maybe maybe we can just give it a little spin to, with our last uh, bits of energy to talk about the Guaido era and uh, I mean kind of like There, there was an attempt for people who don't know what happened is that is that uh, in Venezuela there is a part of the constitution which says that if uh, the government becomes tyrannical towards itself the president of the congress becomes the president of the country am i right well not if it's become not if it becomes tyrannical but if there is no elected president uh -huh. we have six year terms if there is no elected president mm -hmm. then the president of congress becomes president so so the 
government let's put it again in the context of american uh, of the of the american uh, political system imagine for a moment that the uh, who 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 how was the creation how was the constitutional reform committee created who who there was a presidential decree or the constituyente. constituyente yes no the, the, there was a sham election uh -huh. without participation and i mean a completely sham election Okay, so through a sham election, uh, and we can provide the material for anybody who is interested. I mean, if you write us in the comments or whatever, we're really happy to. There's so much evidence of that sham elections, uh, and uh, I mean, because the, the, here's the thing. I mean, the, the problem is not about how the votes were counted or the problems were. It's just about how the whole process was instituted and who can go to the elections and what are the the positions that are being voted for, etc. Mm. <coughs> so, so. A second Congress is created. Imagine that in the USA, a third Congress is created. And then this Congress is supposed to have the role of rewriting the Constitution. Am I correct? And eventually the whole political system decides that this is the Congress who has the power. And so, actually, I'm going to fall apart. Can you explain what happened there? Because you're going to say it a lot better. No, I mean, it's so in the year 2015, uh, the Democratic Forces won Congress. And exactly. this is uh, uh, the like a, a, a major breakthrough in our fight for freedom because uh, it, it it hasn't happened before, and obviously the the response from Maduro was to uh, bring it down, and they would bring it down with decisions of the Supreme Court saying that any law by the National Assembly was in, unconstitutional, and then, as you are saying. It tried to substitute the the legitimate Congress with a parallel sham, uh, completely communist um, um, uh, parallel institution, which is called the Constituent uh, Assembly, and it really doesn't do anything. By the way, it was just an attempt to to bypass Congress, but it it, it was not successful because the international community still recognizes uh, Congress as as the only legitimate representative of the Venezuelan people. So what happened afterwards is that in 2018, uh, Maduro did a completely sham election for president, yeah. completely sham. All the candidates were banned. All the political parties were banned. There were no international observers. Like it, it was complete, complete sham in which he tried to get reelected, but we didn't recognize the election and the international community uh -huh. didn't recognize the election. So what happened was that the term of Maduro ends, ended in the 10th of January of 2019. That was the, the, yeah. the end of his term. And since there were no presidential elections, so no president-elect, the president of Congress, which is Juan, Juan Guaido, constitutionally assumes the presidency of the country. So this is a constitutional Uh, yeah. Mandate. Yeah. Of Guaido course. didn't have an option. Like he, he didn't have an option to say, "Oh, I'm not." No, no, you are, because you are you are the president of Venezuela, even if you don't want it to. I really hated how the BBC was calling itself proclaimed president, and not only the BBC, yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. really stupid, man. It's like, come on, you're not helping completely. here. Yeah. Completely, completely. It, it, it was very bad. So. So well, I mean, 59 countries uh, of the world recognize uh, Juan Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela. That's not a that's not a small thing, and it's not that 140 recognize Maduro. They just don't care. Right. It's just it's just Cuba, Nicaragua, Russia, China, and and uh, North Korea, and a couple more that that actively recognize Maduro. And and uh, South Ossetia. The Republic of South Ossetia. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't recognize the existence of that. Uh, I'm telling you. What, I, I once. I once had to go uh, there. Uh, I didn't went in the end, but I it was in my plans. And I and I. If you go to the Wikipedia article, you will see that there are three countries that recognize South Ossetia as a country: it's Venezuela, Bolivia, and uh, I don't remember what's the third one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so okay. Um, this uh, Guaido, which is once again recapping, he was the president of Congress. There was a fraud elections in our constitution. It says that if there is no president, the president of the Congress takes power. So Guaido assumes the presidency le legitimately as a as a figure in our constitution in 2019. And well, what has happened now is that 
I mean, in the end, I remember our great friend, mutual friend, uh, Ricardo Valian, and well, this is a uh, obvious uh, sentence from the history of political thinking. I mean, in the end, the monopoly of the use of force is what decides the game. So, I mean, the monopoly of the use of force is really in the hands of Maduro, and so this constitutional figure has obviously been ignored by the powers to be, and so Venezuela finds itself nowadays with two governments. It's important to note for the people who don't know the story that really the Congress, with the rigged elections, was won with, uh, please correct my number, 70% of approval, am I correct? Uh, well, it got sixty-six percent mm -hmm. of the of the of the um, how do you say this? The posts, the the seats the in the, the seats, yeah, the, the seats. seats, yeah. It got sixty-six percent of the seats, yes. Yeah. So, so even with the rigged situation, that's how <laughs> I have no idea how they let it go. I mean, how they let it through. I mean, I guess somebody because really... the oil collapsed. The oil collapsed in two thousand fourteen. And, and this was December 2015. So everyone just hated Maduro with their gut. The, our history is the history for the oil prices. Yeah. Uh, why the military is so loyal to Maduro? Well, because uh, Maduro has compromat. Mm -hmm. a good Russian word <laughs> on them. I see. And uh, not only that, but uh, they do not see... Uh, brighter future with us because maybe we have not um, communicated it better or uh, maybe because it's true for some of them I mean uh, people that are involved in narcotic trafficking deep human rights violations torture there is no brighter future for them Yeah. Ah. Okay. So I mean, uh, of course they they know that it's a generational thing. It's not an institutional thing. It's like this generation of military know that down the road there is just jail or death for them, kind of. And so they have no option. Jail or exile. You know, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily bad. I man, see that, that much. I always thought that Russia is huge. Man, all of those crooks can come here. No props. I mean, really, they're they're, <laughs> they're going to have a nice time, man. This is a great country. I mean. <laughs> I have. I am not against. Yeah, yeah. If you guys come here, I mean, just 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 go and, somewhere. And it, yeah. it would be so funny. It would be so funny if they go to Crimea, and <laughs> because it's the warmer place, you know. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, even there is a chance for Russia to play with it. I mean, they can offer protected exile uh, in Crimea, and the international community also joins. Like, I mean, I'm just saying there. They Man, there is a beach there that is comparable to Venezuelan beaches. I'm telling you, I saw it with my own eyes. Seriously? I will send you the photos, man. Like it's really wow. serious. Like yeah, it's called Bellaus. It's just, it's like Playa El Agua, but but it's 30 kilometers. Like I, I don't joke. Wow. Like yeah, it's a it's beautiful white sand. I mean, when I sat there with my wife and I I just chilled there and this waters. I mean, crystalline blue waters. It's, it's super beautiful. I was like, okay, I can live here. Like. I can stay here forever. It's fine. Okay. 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 Good. Well, Mr. Sierra, we did two hours, man. Like, okay, I mean, well, this is just the first one. We have so many topics remained open. Uh, and that's amazing that uh, two hours is absolutely not enough to discuss this. I'm very happy that Definitely. this is this is how it all started. And uh, you're going to be a regular uh, guest in uh, our show. And I'm sure that you're going to be in Russia once and we're going to be able to do this in person. I would love to. I would love to go to Russia. I really admire uh, Russian history, Russian people, it, it, it's, its culture. I... I I, I was personally affected by by something I read uh, that Tolstoy wrote, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm a big admirer and I would love to go. Look, and the best news, man, is that is fifty times better than that. I'm telling you, man. Like like I mean, <laughs> I, some people joke that I and I'm sure that in the future, if this if this uh, show becomes popular or something, many people are gonna think that I'm some sort of Russian asset or for the government or something. I'm telling you, it's 100 percent voluntary. My wife is Russian. <laughs> I came here without knowing anybody. And I build a full life that includes traveling with the biggest rock star of the country across the whole country. And I saw everything from the bottom up. And I have been shocked about how human this place is. And, and uh, I mean, of course, there are super things that irritate me so much, like living in any place. But but Russia is a... Uh, is, uh, is, uh, I, I, I'm telling you, and I tell this for the people. I mean, and, I, and so much people are going to hate me for this, I know. But... but 
man, Russia is not an evil force. The only thing that people here want is to be left alone. Like, I mean, that's kind of it. I mean, there is really not like a... There is a power game, of course, because, you know, I used to be super anti-military in my life. Like, I mean, I was always dreaming like, oh, like, you should all be like Costa Rica and not have a military, you know, and uh, and then and then something interesting happened. There was the... Um, the Crimea situation and uh, and the sanctions started and then the prices of everything doubled man like really why mm. uh, we saw it and we arrived it with our own eyes it was a process like of two three years especially food it was really an aggressive change I mean because in that moment the government and the industry had to resort a lot of things especially because of uh, restrictions in the final finance transactions that that companies can make and and so it became really hard to make business here and, and all the life became expensive for everybody and of course many people hate what's going on and many people hate me for what i'm about to say but i was really inspired about how people took it here like okay my independence because i mean we will we can have a whole episode about crimea because crimea it's i mean even though it's some weird international law move i mean that's a piece of russia and i mean it, it's it's in my opinion i mean and so i'm gonna get so much hate for this but that's my opinion i mean i understand that kind of process um and i think as an amateur thinker here that has no stake on the game that their average russian person said something like my my independence has no price even though everything will become twice as pricey i prefer to be independent and pay more money I, as, as an individual you know i pref prefer my the sovereignty of my country i mean in this case not specifically talking about crimea but i prefer to be the master of my own fate and pay more money than not to be the master of my own fate and pay no more money that's why in my opinion there were no riots or anything because People took it like that. Today is the 9th of May. I woke up in the morning and my wife was watching a movie from the Second World War, showing it to my child. It's the first movie that my child has ever seen in his life. Because the history here and the, and the things that this country has lived has been so intense that has produced a very, very interesting individual that it's really just focused in inwards. I mean, Russians don't give a damn about conquering Brazil or Venezuela or they just don't care. The only thing that they care is to be strong, to be like a powerful economy and to be not bullied. You cannot bully this place. And so, because that's how Russians are. You just don't bully a Russian. You know, he's gonna fucking fight back because they are like that. That's why, you know, this is very shocking, but when you're driving around the city there are stickers. I, I don't like this at all, but it's a very famous thing and people commented a lot here. There are stickers in the car that says 1941 1945 we could do it again it's it's very popular i mean about the victory on the second world war it's like we could do it again uh mm. so so this is a place that has because of the amount of blood and and uh, and, uh, and the amount of uh suffering that this place has experienced it crystallized in some sort of experience which is the russian experience which is something that it's just very independent and unique. This is not Europe. This is not Ukraine. I mean, it's just very different. This is Russia. And uh, once I was, I'm telling you all this pretext because I was once driving next to the Kremlin, just coincidentally. And then I thought, man, I'm so happy that there is a powerful military here that can preserve this mm. independence. And that nobody can just come here and bully us because they just can't. And that's how it's going to be. And that's the legacy of the Soviet Union, by the way. 8,000 nuclear weapons. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but that's the key fa definitive, definite factor in today's world. The fact that Russia has 8,000 nuclear weapons in America has, well, I don't know how many nowadays, I think 4,000 or something, but in the peak of the Cold War, I think it was 13,000 nuclear weapons or something. Uh... So, I mean, what the people that are amateur thinkers about uh, politics in, in the world don't take into consideration is that these kind of factors are in play. This is not an evil power play of somebody sitting on a chair and just... This is a more complicated thing. It, it, it has to do with the evil power play of somebody sitting on a chair. But there is also my friend Pavel, who, who is a guitarist of my band, who today woke up and was crying. And my wife, who was... My wife was crying today, man. I saw her watching a movie that she watches every year. She was crying just by watching it. Because of what it meant that 23 million people died here in the Second World War. This is inconceivable. It's like the whole population of Venezuela practically wiped out in, in, in four years. And so people fought so hard for that. And now we find ourselves in a present in which people want to preserve that independence. It's like, 
and and that's I think that's the main force that people don't think about that's behind Russia. I mean, the, people have this James Bond image of this country, like as if we're all like evil evil James Bond villains who are seeking for global domination. Mm, I think what we're seeking is for non-global bullying, kind of, and uh, and that this has a lot of and this is hey, I'm a super amateur here, and I I know that it's the opinion of a musician has nothing to do with a professional point of view, but I tell you this is a person who lives here underground and who has traveled the whole country. Um, there is not this global domination thirst that people believe Russians have. The only thirst that there is is for Russia to be able to be the master of its own fate, fate forever as it has been forever. And that's why we have a thousand nuclear weapons. That's it. Yeah. No, I, 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 I remember one, one trip we once did to the coast of Aragua, mm -hmm. uh, to, to Cuyagua. Uh, Russian special forces are patrolling the area now. <laughs> um, I, I, I do think that, that this, this point of, of trying to get leverage in a faraway place to increase um, your position internally is what, what they're thinking. But Venezuelans are the victims, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And I think yeah. It, 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 you know, uh, I think it has to, I mean, I, I, I uh, it's, it's weird because as you say, they're not into conquering us or they're not into like, it, I, I don't even think they're they're after economic exploitation. They're Man, they have lost billions. Gain. They have lost billions of dollars in Venezuela. Yeah, yeah. they're after geopolitical gain uh, with this leverage in a worldwide negotiation. I just I just hope that um, the that it, it can end soon, so we can have a completely different yeah. relationship with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope that. I mean, I hope that the. With the current world where we're sitting in, everything is so uncertain that who knows what's going to happen. Um, I just would like to push a message out that I, I think the best thing I can say is the Bond villain thing. I mean, there's there are there, this is not like a country full of James Bond villains who want to just like uh, live in a in a tropical island and build a you know. Uh, the only thing that people want here is to 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 be able to tell to their grandpas who died in the second world war when in the future when they die and go to heaven you know it's like uh, i did what i could to preserve that independence that you fought for something like that but anyways that's a, yeah. that's another that's a topic of another whole stream thank you very much man we're gonna do this again so no, i'm very i'm very happy to have done this and i'm very happy to have talked with you for so long yeah and, it's and i hope I hope that the people that watch uh, that watch this uh you know could 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 maybe get more curious about it. I'm 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 always happy. Maybe you should uh, I don't know in in the intro or something put my Twitter handle. Of Even course, I don't use it that much. Of course, Daniel Sierra L A L A. Uh, so you can write me there or, or send me an email. Like I I would be happy to continue the conversation. Absolutely, I, I, I would love to. Absolutely, thank you very much, man. And uh, well, for the whole world. Uh, we need to gain more uh, conscious about what's going on uh, every day and just not go with what the news are telling us. You know, I don't know about you, but 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 I mean, I have something like 15 news sources uh, or 20 news sources and people, etc. Because if you read what Russia Today is saying and then you read what CNN is saying, it's just it's just you're all done. super biased and you're done. And uh, the only you way to go to primary documents, you cannot you, you, you also have to read not only news. That's yeah. Right. And also, I mean, this kind of long format is key. I mean, this cannot be discussed in 15 minutes. And if we took two hours and 20 minutes and we didn't even scratch the surface, that's how I feel. Totally, totally, totally. And that's amazing. So, well, it's really hard to say goodbye to you because I love you so much, but I guess I can call you on WhatsApp later and we can continue talking. Sure. <laughs> Take My care, friend, man. One, one big hug. Uh, Same to you. I'm very happy to see you so well and say hi to... And then to see you. All right. Take care, everybody. This was the episode one of the Leo Perez show. We started. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.